We're really very pleased to have with us this evening uh, one of America's most distinguished former military commanders. Uh, General uh, Tony Zinni joined the Marine Corps back in 1961 at the age of 18, uh, and over the next four, decade, four decades ended up in more than 70 countries and more than a few wars and humanitarian operations. Uh, his combat experience ranged from f fighting in, in Vietnam, uh, where he was, uh, he was wounded, to directing strikes against uh, Iraqi forces and al-Qaeda terrorists. But he also conducted a number of, um, of non-combat security operations, uh, uh, including emergency relief in, uh, in Asia and evacuations from Africa. Uh, his final command before retiring from the military 14 years ago was as head of Central Command, which uh, has responsibility for the Middle East. Uh, soon after, he became President Bush's envoy to the Middle East and, sh and showed Cassandra-like foresight in warning about the risks of uh, invading Iraq. Uh, some of his own recommendations to use overwhelming force if the invasion did go ahead and also to adopt a comprehensive uh, reconstruction plan were dismissed by Donald Rumsfeld's Pentagon and, and later General, Zin <coughs> General Zinni became one of the first in a widening circle of retired generals to to call for Rumsfeld's removal. Uh, in addition to his military career and, and various diplomatic missions, General Zinni also worked in the business world for a time helping lead uh, BAE Systems, the aerospace and ele electronics giant. Uh, he's authored several previous works, including a popular memoir co-written with Tom Clancy titled Battle Ready, uh, a book called The Battle for Peace that outlined long-term strategies for dealing with global crises and emerging markets. I mean emerging threats, uh, and another book titled Leading the Charge on Lessons in Leadership from the Battlefield to the Boardroom. Uh, in his latest work, Before the First Shots Are Fired, How America Can Win or Lose Off the Battlefield, General Zinni and co-author Tony, is it Tony Colts? Colts? Um, they, uh, they critically examine how the U.S. formulates national security strategy and decides to take military action and how these processes could be much improved. Uh, of course, with the Obama administration now being urged to intervene more forcefully in Ukraine, Syria, and elsewhere, the history of past interventions that General uh, Zinni recounts and the advice he offers are really uh, all the more relevant. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming General Tony Zinni. Thank you, thank you. About uh, six years ago, I decided to write a book, uh, which was the beginning of, of this current book, but it was very different than how this book ended up. I was troubled by how our involvement in conflicts had, had changed so much. We were getting more immersed in nation building. We had unclear reasons for using our military our military was becoming uh, our primary uh, source of uh, conducting our foreign policy. Uh, and I thought that much of this might have to do with the way we conducted operations on the ground. I had done assessments in Afghanistan, in, a, in, in Iraq, and had seen how we were doing business on the ground. Of course, I had experience in Vietnam and three, two tours there, three tours in Somalia. And I really thought that it would be important to explain to the American people what our troops go through and how this may be very different than maybe the model in our minds, which is the good war, the greatest generation, uh, how it's so different. The reasons you're involved in there, what you have to do, the mix of humanitarian and other issues in with uh, combat. So this was really going to be a battlefield perspective. But the more I began to research and the more I began to look at it, something else kept hitting me. More and more I saw, as you were with the troops on the ground, most of them got it. They understand at the village level what had to be done. They understood, even though the direction they may have been given wasn't right, they understood what had to be done on the ground to make it right. And you didn't find their lessons learned right in the, the, uh, on the ground in those villages coming up even to the operational level in the military, let alone to the strategic and policy level. So it, ca it caused me to take another step back and look from a different direction. 
What is it that goes on before our troops put, as the uh, book implies, puts the first boot on the ground or fires the first shot? What all happens? And then while they're out there conducting operations, what's happening off the battlefield? What kinds of political decisions are made? What kinds of policies are being set? How does the president and the, and the political leadership analyze what goes on? What kind of advice does the president get? What kind of strategy does the president produce or not produce? And this became a much more complex and complicated environment, one I saw very little written about. You can go through these shelves here, and you could take any conflict we've been in. You go to the military history section, and you're going to see a plethora of books written about the battlefield experience, about the war. You can go on to the military campuses of our war colleges, our command and staff colleges, and you will see us pour over the history and the accounts uh, to learn and glean the lessons learned. What did we do right and what did we do wrong in the military? You know, the constant upgrading of our doctrine and trying to understand that. But if you look at the political decision makers, do they ever look back? Because they come and go. You know, about every four years, even if an administration gets a second term, we turn over the leadership. may not be the president and vice president, but certainly the secretaries of the departments and, and may, many of the agencies, and certainly at the levels below that. There's no corporate memory. There's no understanding what we might have done wrong. If there was a screw-up at that level, everybody gets a Medal of Freedom and goes home. You know, and, and you know, that doesn't happen in the military. I'm certainly not saying the military is perfect. We have plenty of generals that uh, should and, 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 and are held accountable. Uh, and certainly we look back and we agonize over what might have gone wrong. The moment that I decided to really and truly get at this subject, and maybe with a, a, some passion that I hope you, you would see in the book, was uh, Secretary Rumsfeld. He was asked, uh, as Iraq was moving on and things were not going well, at a press conference a reporter asked him, isn't this looking a lot like Vietnam? And his answer was no. Uh, all wars are different. No war is like previous wars. No war is like the last war, and no war is like the next war. They're all different. And you know, it just didn't ring true to me, because having been through 40 years in the Marine Corps and seeing you know, my share of these wars, I saw a lot of uh, Groundhog Days in these conflicts and, and the way the political decision-making was made or not made in competent ways. So that got me more energized to look at how we do this. And so... You have, to, you have to understand, you know, in one way, Secretary Rumsfeld was right. There are differences, but there is a pattern. There is a structure to the way we go about it. And so I wanted to take some sort of framework to look at all our most recent conflicts and even going back a little bit in history as to how we dealt with them and address them at that political level. So I broke the book down into parts. The first part you would see has to do is why did we commit our military? What was the reason? Now, in our history, I think when you go back, I listed the causes going back to the Revolutionary War, and some are pretty clear. When somebody blows up our, our, our naval ships at Pearl Harbor or destroys the uh, Twin Towers or attacks the Pentagon, clearly that's a cause for war. But what about WMD that's not there? What about the Gulf of Tonkin, an attack that never took place, you know, inside the, the territorial or outside the territorial waters of uh, North Vietnam? And there are times we've gone to war just to expand our own territory. There are times we've gone to war just to promote business. In the old banana wars in the 20s and 30s, you know, the saying was, if it's good for United Fruit, it's good for America. So we had Marines down here in Haiti and Nicaragua and Santo Domingo. So our reasons for going to war are varied. And some of them, you know, it's hard to figure out why. We still ask questions, even the most recent conflicts. You know, why did George Bush really go into Iraq? Did he really believe WMD? Uh, I mentioned in there that I actually did work for the CIA on Iraq WMD. I saw the briefings. There was no credible evidence of a, uh, an ongoing program in Iraq, as hard as that may be to believe. And, and it was clear they didn't possess it. The inspectors were back in and, and, and saying there was nothing there. The, you know, the, uh, Mohammed al-Baradai and Hans Blix. So what's the reason? 
you know, I think this is, a, it sounds pretty simple, but it gets complicated when you look more deeply. Sometimes we've had presidents that have preset the reason for war. Remember the red lines? You know, a president sets a red line, he better be very careful because you can say on one hand, a red line tells the bad guys what's unacceptable. The red line also tells you when you're going to fight, pre-commits you, and allows him, the bad guy, to call the card if he feels it's to advantage, his advantage. We saw that recently happen with Syria. There have been presidential doctrines, the Truman Doctrine, the Kennedy Doctrine, that really set conditions under which we would fight. And sometimes it's wise for a president not to be too specific. You know, one of the reasons we went to war in Korea is when we outlined what we would fight for, for one reason or another, we didn't include Korea. And so the potential enemy saw that that was up for grabs. So a lot of times... The, uh, the rationale, the reason for war, the reason for committing our military is not that clear. And so, my, you know, my advice would be for a, a president that's making this decision or a Congress that's going to vote to support it is to understand clearly why we're doing this. The next thing that takes place is the analysis. This is where the intel guys come in and tell all the leadership, you know, what's happening on the ground, tells them what the threat is, tells them what the potential uh, for the threat to act and how it might be. Then, the, in addition to that analysis, the presidents receive advice. How do they get advice? Every president has done it differently. I just want to give you a few examples, because I, I went back in history and looked at how every president set up how he would receive advice in a crisis. Let me start, let me give you an example of Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower, when he first came into office, met with his Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, and he said, uh, I want to set up a group of people that are, you know, very wise, strategically oriented, have different opinions, and that's very important, and I want to, on time of crisis, call them in, and I want to hear their views, and I want to deliberately get people that have all kinds of these different views. I don't want them all lockstep. He made this proposal to the secretary in the solarium room. So the group became the solarium group. And they had people in there like George Kennan, I mean, people that were regarded as probably some of our greatest strategic thinkers, even some uh, Pentagon generals that weren't necessarily the top rank, but they were noted for their strategic thinking. Eisenhower, when the crisis occurred, made sure they were briefed up and understood it, and he had them debate each other. He never said a word. He didn't ask questions, and he didn't make comments, he, because he didn't want to influence it. He just took notes. Now, that's one method. We certainly know that there are presidents who are influenced by individuals. We know that there are powerful uh, individuals in, in government or as advisors, people like uh, uh, Kissinger and Brzezinski. Uh, we know that some presidents like Wilson had uh, somebody like uh, Colonel George House, who was not in government, but he relied on him, especially right up to the war and, and during the war, as his chief advisor on foreign policy and national security. Some used the structure. Some, the National Security Council, this president really relies on them very heavily. Some use the cabinet very effectively. George H.W. Bush, very strong cabinet. You know, if you remember back to James Baker, Dick Cheney, Colin Powell, you know, Brent Scowcroft, uh, he used that body. And, and so there's no set way advice is given. And sometimes during this process, one position is taken without a fair analysis of maybe others. You know, we can read plenty about more recently uh, President George Bush's administration. You had Colin Powell on one side that really wasn't the insider. It was Rumsfeld and Cheney. And that's where the president relied on his advice, and you really didn't get an equal voice from somebody in there in the, in the most powerful position in the cabinet as secretary of state. Then the decision gets made, and the president is presented, if this works well, with options. I had a diplomat tell me the president gets laid before him everything from a strong letter of protest to a 10 kT airburst, you know, nuclear airburst, and somewhere in there he's got to sort out an option. Well, obviously it's a little more defined uh, than that. Uh, probably lately the most critical thing you can say 
is there's a tendency to over rely on military options. There's not enough discussion of, uh, of, of the other elements of power that might come into play. And in some cases, those other elements of power, they don't really have the resources or the clout that really allow them to be moved up front and compete with the military options. Once a decision is made, you would hope that the president and his leadership decide on a strategy, set the political objectives. You know, make sure we know what our military uh, knows what they're, they're supposed to do and why. I, had a, I was a student at the National War College as a lieutenant colonel, and we had this member of Congress, Congress come over to speak to us. His name was Newt Ginrich. And uh, Newt was giving us lessons, you know, telling us young lieutenant colonels, someday some of you may be wearing a lot of stars, and, one, and your political masters are going to come to you and say, go out and do this, some military task. He said, the most important question you could ask at that moment is, and then what? You know, okay, you want me to take down the regime in Baghdad, and then what? You know, you want me to uh, go into Afghanistan and try to hunt down al-Qaeda, mm -hmm. kick out the Taliban, and then what? Because if the and then what questions are not answered in a strategy clearly, the political objectives are not set, you've got a big problem. We can charge it up to Mission Creek, but, you know, the, the mission goes adrift, we get stuck, we have words for this, quagmires, you know, we're mired down, and it all comes about, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there, uh, but oftentimes maybe not the there you really want. So the strategy becomes important. I would offer to you, and this is my own personal judgment, we haven't thought or acted strategically since the end of the Cold War. 25 years ago. We've made no attempt to understand our world that we live in now. We have no, made no attempt to identify our role in this world, our power, our purpose, and what we should do, uh, and how we should act. And, and I think that's led to this. Uh, it, it gets to be too hard in a confused world, so we have no strategy. When you have no strategy and you go out to the battlefield, what do you see? You see us all over the map. Remember, Iraq was supposed to be a liberation, flowers in the street. You know, we were, it was a cakewalk. This is what we were hearing. Those of us that knew Iraq and been in that part of the world for a quarter of a century were saying, ain't going to happen that way. But no one was listening. You know, and the same thing in, in Afghanistan. What, what were we staying there to do and why? So you either have an excellent strategy to what you want to do. You piece it together in, in a very uh, rational way. It brings in all the elements of power. It's a whole of government approach. Uh, and it allows the military and the other elements of government to understand what they're supposed to achieve and how that leads to your political uh, objectives. Then something that has become more important has to happen. And it's what I refer to in the book as the battle of the narrative. You know. Uh, Enemies now in the battlefield, uh, even like these non-state entities like ISIS and Al-Qaeda and others, have a voice. You know, social media, uh, information technology allows them to engage. The world demands of us that we make our case for war. We're not an empire. It's not up to the queen to decide, you know, who we fight and why on a whim. That Our president, our leadership has to go out and make the case for war. You can see that now. I mean, the President, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, every day, you know, we, we can't decide where, whether we want to manage ISIS or destroy them. I mean, it's still confusing, but the narrative has to go out there. The American people have to be convinced. Some presidents were great at this. FDR, fireside chats. Ronald Reagan, the great communicator. You know, some presidents were naturally uh, gifted and be able to do this and to keep everybody's head in the game as, as the conflict went on. Others have been less able to do that or didn't understand what needed to be done, what the need was for the domestic audience, for the international audience, and the audience that we're fighting against the enemy. And that takes, a, you know, that's a real art to be able to be that articulate and to make sure that you're dominating and winning that battle of the narrative. Now, before you go to, uh, to commit the military, you got to have a military that's ready to go and standing, but what kind of military? I came across an interesting letter. It was written by uh, someone uh, named uh, Richard Henry Lee in 1776. Richard Henry, Henry Lee was a very prominent Virginian uh, politician, and he wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson. 
And he said to Thomas Jefferson, we will never continue to exist as a democracy unless we have a military complex, a military industrial complex. Now, everybody thinks Eisenhower said it first. And, and I, I just want to tell you a little story about how this came about. I'm on the Board of Trustees of Colonial Williamsburg. I live in Williamsburg. And this statement about this sort of military complex, military industrial complex, has always kind of befuddled everybody there that, that are looking in the Colonial Williamsburg city as to where was this? Because it got called the armory. So everybody was looking for a single building or an entity. But what, in fact, it became was a series of buildings. And, and, and now they've reconstructed them and have been able to identify them now more clearly. Because, like, in one case, they were tin, tinsmiths who made equipment for the soldiers. Tin cups, canteens. Another place, they repaired weapons. Another place, they prepared rations for the troops. But in order to make it a going concern, they also did commercial work. So this complex that's now been reconstructed in Colonial Williamsburg Primary, primary mission was to support the military, you know, the, the, the army, uh, and uh, its secondary mission was to remain viable, to sell products, obviously, on the commercial uh, side. So this, this industrial complex goes back to the roots of our beginning. Now, Eisenhower's speech is interesting, too, because I found that almost everybody that quotes it never read it. Because if you read it, the first thing Eisenhower said is, our arms must be mighty. Then he goes on to warn us against uh, this growing military-industrial complex that is eating up the federal budget. When Eisenhower made that speech, over 50% of our federal budget went to national security. Now, here's the president's got domestic issues and other things going on and watching over 50 percent. Right now, it's 15 percent and dropping over the next years. It, that's just one measure. It's not, I'm not making a case that it's better or worse. I'm just saying that you can see why Eisenhower as president is concerned. As a five-star general, he was certainly happy about that. In three and a half years from the time Pearl Harbor was attacked, we went from the 17th largest army in the world behind Romania to the greatest powerful, most powerful army, air force, marine corps, navy, you know, in existence. Every single weapon systems we had was inferior to the German and Japanese. Three and a half years later, it was superior to all of them. Uh, this was actually the strategy. FDR, when the decision was made after Pearl Harbor was attacked and we engaged in the war, his primary focus was to become the arsenal of democracy outproduce those guys, not only great gain in, in greater technology, but over the overwhelming with uh, America's industrial uh, capability. In the, in the middle of the war, Germany was producing 4,000 tanks a year. We were producing 4,000 tanks a month, you know, when we had ginned up the, the military industrial complex. In addition to that, during the Cold War, in the arms race, very expensive, but we were beating the, the Soviets and others in every system. If they tried to field the system to keep up with us, we advanced generations ahead. And that, I, I would offer to you, was part of the reason to collapse the Soviet empire. I think Gorbachev realized they couldn't keep pace with us in, in, in that respect. But you have to have some kind of military. You can't afford the perfect military. We can't. I mean, even our country can't. I don't know any general or admiral would tell you we could. Uh, every one of us sort of wants to put our favorite program out there and say this is critically important. But the decision has to be where do you accept risk? You know, where, where are you going to say I will take a chance and I won't invest in this? Right now, the attitude is not to invest in ground forces. I don't know what the hang up is about boots on the ground. We got 1,100 troops in Iraq. I don't think they're wearing sneakers. So I don't know what boots on the ground means. And sometimes boots on the ground, as was demonstrated in the first Gulf War, was the quickest and shortest way to end it. The Powell Doctrine, the Weinberger Doctrine, overwhelming force, ended quickly, used the power of the United States. This goes back, obviously, to FDR. But now we've tried to finesse it, and we get in trouble when we try to, to do that. But a structure has to be in place. And the structure is very complex. The decisions as to what to support. It would be great if we had a strategy, and then when you looked at what to fund and what to invest in would be based on that strategy. When you don't have a strategy, 
And when it goes to Congress to decide which programs to be funded, very little has to do with understanding the threat. It has to do more with what's made in my district. You know, that's going to be what carries today, or what's my pet project? So it's dysfunctional in many ways, and I describe other ways in the book that it's dysfunctional. The whole system of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, our combatant commanders, our service chiefs, it is a very complicated, complex system. I used to teach in the government department at William & Mary, amongst other uh, colleges. And I can remember the uh, professor who taught the structure of the U.S. government when it came to the Pentagon, Department of Defense, he used to come down to me and say, would you come in and explain it to the students? <laughs> so I would come in and I had a blackboard and I would draw, you know, this, this, this plumbing up, you know, uh, how it, it goes. You know, this is the Joint Chiefs of Staff. They report to Secretary of Defense. They have no real power. These are the combatant commanders. You know, they report di directly to the Secretary of Defense. These are the service chiefs who report to the service secretaries who report to the Secretary of Defense, you know, and try to explain all the cross relationships. And I can remember one uh, young student raised her hand and said, Professor Zinni, are you going to test us on this stuff? <laughs> and I said, I, I would never be so cruel. Neither would, would, would your professor. But once the decision is made to commit the force, then you've got to do two things. Decide how you're going to fight the fight and who's going to be in charge. You've got to pick the generals. You know, we used to be very good at this. You know, Eisenhower, Bradley, Nimitz. You know, we, 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 we had guys that came on, stayed on, and knew what they were doing. If they didn't, we moved, you know, on, on from that. But usually, excuse me, the first picks were pretty good. Uh, I, went, I, I did an assessment in Iraq and Afghanistan, did an assessment for General Odierno and Ambassador Crocker in one, and then uh, for uh, General uh, 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 Allen in, in uh, Afghanistan. When I got to Afghanistan, or as I was arriving, I decided to make sure I was up to snuff on what had happened. This was the 10th year of the war in Afghanistan. Suddenly it struck me, we had had 10 generals in command in 10 years. Then I went back and looked at the CENTCOM commander, U.S. Central Command, which is a regional command. We had seven in 10 years. We had five chairmen of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, three secretaries of defense, and two presidents. Now, I'm trying to think how this might have gone down in World War II <laughs> if, you know, Eisenhower and Bradley after one year said, time to go home, let's change the guy out, and we don't like the cut of his jib, replace him. And when I got on the ground, I was troubled by this because anybody knows that if you don't have consistency in command, you're going to have those problems find their way down to the ranks and, and, and cause problems. And I met a, 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 a brigadier general. He was National Guard, U.S. Uh, Army National Guard, who had been in a, Afghanistan for a long time. And he had some obscure program he was running, and I was supposed to have lunch with him to talk about this. Well, we, since he was so astute, and we got off on this subject. He said something that really hit home to me. He said, this has not been a 10-year war. It's been 10 one-year wars. Every general that comes in has got another damn good idea. And who pays for it when the rules of engagement change, the direction of the operations change? It's that sergeant and ca captain down there that get whipped around. And as I went down in the ranks, I could see that. My son's a Marine. He spent six tours in Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere during the uh, global war on terrorism. And, you know, he, he's had three in Afghanistan, he had several in, in Iraq. And I kept asking, when you went back, did you see the difference? He said, yeah, everything changes. You know, all the direction changes, all the uh, objectives change, uh, what you're allowed to do and not allowed to do, rules of engagement change. You know, it's crazy to try to keep up with that. So how, and then when, what do you choose to do on the ground? Remember General Petraeus comes in and we resurrect counterinsurgency operations, COIN, C-O-I-N. The old Vietnam doctrine, brushed off, spruced up, and thrown in. I don't think our political leadership understood what that was going to get us into. First of all, you need a hell of a lot of troops for a long time to really conduct a counterinsurgency operation. It even says it in the manual. I mean, they were going in with too few troops. The manual even says it. And it costs a heck of a lot more than you think it does. And I don't think that dawned on our leadership that you are having two trillion dollar wars now. And when you stop, uh, you know, I have a chapter in the book called How the Hell Do We Get Here? Because all of a sudden, if I, I use the example of someone who may have gone into a coma right after 9-11 and woke up. I mean, maybe right after President Bush stood on that pile and said the people that did this will hear from us. 
and would say, okay, do we get them? Well, we got Osama bin Laden. Did we wipe out Al Qaeda? No, it kind of metastasized all over the world now. It's, it's, it's everywhere. It's in Africa. It's, it's called Boko Haram. It's called uh, you know, Al Shabaab. You know, it's, uh, it morphs into ISIS. You know, so we didn't get them. We didn't really put a stake in their heart. Oh, so what happened? Well, we went into Iraq and, wait a minute, you went into Iraq? What did Iraq have to do with 9-11? <laughs> Why were we in Iraq? Well, you know, we decided we're going to change everything in the Middle East. We're going to shake and bake some democracy, have a few elections, and it's going to spread like wildfire. This was the plan. Well, what's happened? Well, we're still there, you know, and nothing much has happened. We're rebuilding the nation, and here's the costs and the casualties. Well, what about Afghanistan? Did we get Al Qaeda? No, they left. They went into Pakistan. Well, did we go after them? No, we really stayed there. To do what? Well, we're rebuilding that nation, too, and that's up to a trillion dollars, and we have these casualties. I mean, think about it in those terms. It is absolutely insane. No direction, constantly changing, on the ground having generals come in that want to go to COIN, want to go to uh, counterterrorism operations, uh, uh, you know, they want to do one light, one heavy. And you have this ludicrous exchange between the military and the political leadership. General McChrystal gets asked, how many troops do you need to, get to, to win this war? He comes back, does a military analysis, and says 40,000. And the president says you're getting 30,000. Well, I understand 40,000. You could argue with it on military terms. You could say, well, he made a military misjudgment. Or, but what's 30,000? Where did that come from? That's a political number. You know, we're not going to have boots on the ground. Why? Sometimes boots on the ground, if you want to control people and, and, and terrain, that's what you need to do. Sometimes boots on the ground is the fastest, cleanest, less casualty producing and cheapest way to get the job done. I would take you back to uh, President H.W. Bush when the Kurds were brutalized by Saddam Hussein. I was involved in that operation. And Saddam had chased them into the hills, attempted genocide on the Kurds, chased them in the hills of southern Turkey and into Iran. They were dying up there in the thousands. It was wintertime. We went in, uh, Secretary Baker came out there, saw the situation, and said immediately, phone the president. The president says, in 36 hours, I want airdrops of food, water, medicines. I want a, a special forces group in there. I want air cover. And rapidly, we built up to a 13-nation uh, organization that had ground troops. And we went into northern Iraq, told the Iraqi army, get out or we'll kill you and chased them out of the Kurdish area, reestablished the Kurds, withdrew our ground forces. We flew the no-fly zones that basically the Saudis and the Kuwaitis helped pay for, and we provided protection for them. That quick, without uh, not even the slightest uh, blink of an eye. You know, w when a decision has to be made, when there's uh, the potential for something like genocide or Americans are in danger, I had a discussion with, uh, with the uh, secretary of one of the cabinet uh, positions in Ronald Reagan's administration. He was there when Ronald Reagan made the decision to go into Grenada. Now you remember Beirut bombing had just occurred. The administration was taking all kinds of heat, justifiably. What was the mission in Beirut? Why were they left hanging out there? This was a disaster. Now when Grenada came up, when they had the cabinet meeting and when uh, President Reagan was uh, taking his advice, the advice around the table is do not go into Grenada. This politically will be unacceptable. The American people don't support it. You just had this uh, Beirut disaster. And this uh, cabinet uh, uh, secretary said, Reagan lifted his head up and he said, pointed to the, uh, s the director of Central Intelligence, said, are there any American lives at risk? And he said, well, potentially there are some medical students there that could be at risk. Then he said, the decision is easy. We go in. You know, the, the values, the basis and all, he wasn't going to test politically. He wasn't going to make a statement to tell his enemies. Uh, I'm not using ground forces. You know, my hero when I grew up was Rocky Marciano. I can imagine him saying, I'm not going to throw a left hook in this fight, you know, before he went in. I mean, it, it's ludicrous. I mean, it, it, it makes no sense. It's to, it's to, that goes back to the battle of the narrative, too. And then it's how we measure whether we're winning or succeeding. You know, that you can walk onto an aircraft carrier and declare victory. By the way, a few more years, your troops are still fighting in there. But, you know, how do you measure victory? This is hard. I went through this in Somalia. You know, we were in Somalia. We went in initially to provide security for the humanitarian mission. 
And it was the pottery barn theory, that uh, uh, principle that uh, Colin Powell expressed. You break it, you own it. You touch it, you own it. We went in for all good reasons to Somalia, then we owned it. You know, I got a grandson that's banned from the pottery barn uh, stores. I understand what happens when you go in and you start uh, blasting around. And we, we don't understand that we, we not only own it because we're the biggest gorilla in the room, we own it because anything that is put on the ground is seen as belonging to us. I, my first tour of duty as, an, uh, as a young lieutenant in Vietnam was as an advisor to the Vietnamese Marines. I wore their uniform, I spoke their language, I had to go to language school. I rarely saw another American. W they, Vietnam had a quartering act. In other words, when the, when the Marines or the soldiers or anything moved into a village, we moved into the houses with the people. It, we, we had a quartering act like that back in the revolutionary times. I was in a village in the northern part of South Vietnam I was in the house with the uh, village chief. The mother had prepared us a meal. It was a beautiful evening. And we were sitting outside, and she looked at me, and she said, why are you here? And I said, well, you know, I know the speech. I can tell you we're going to bring democracy, free market economy, all these great things. And she kind of looked confused, and she said, point it south towards Saigon. So you're going to fix all the problems down there. Uh, I said, your directions are wrong. I pointed toward Hanoi. That's what we're here to fix. She said, well, this is the thing I want to leave with you, most importantly. She said, what do you want me to die for? You know, I look at Saigon, and I see these generals. They commit, there's one coup a month down there, rotating generals, corrupt as hell. That government belongs to you guys. You come in here, I mean, I don't think... MacArthur or Eisenhower would have had in Japan or in Germany settled for a government that was corrupt, unresponsive to the people's needs while we were in there, maybe with a lot of troops and maybe in a course of a war paying the ultimate price. But Karzai belongs to us. Maliki belongs to us in the eyes of the people. So you have to be careful as to what you think you're measuring success by and what you're putting in place because we can't want it more than they want it. And everything that's produced while we're there and we're the biggest gorilla in the room belongs to us. The final point I make in the book is how wars end. Because the outcomes in the ending aren't necessarily clean. They can deceive you into you thinking you finished this one. But they could actually lead you to worse problems down the road. I testified before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee as we were getting ready to go into Iraq. And I was asked if we needed to go into Iraq, Senator Luger, who was the chairman at the time, and I said no, there was no imminent threat. And one of the senators on the committee got very irate, and he said, General, I don't get it. What can be worse than Saddam Hussein? You take him out, what can be worse than that? And I said, Senator, you remember Charlie Wilson's war? we all seen the movie. Congress decides to go to war in Afghanistan. We're going to get rid of the Soviet Union. Give them their Vietnam. What can be worse than the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. We got the Taliban and Al-Qaeda as an end result. You know, what can be worse than Saddam Hussein? Now we have ISIS, the Iranians involved in there, you know, a, a chaos and, and disaster going on. So be careful what you wish for. So that, in, sh in, in, in short, is what the book is about. It's less about the soldiers and Marines on the ground, and it's more about the suits and skirts that make the decisions that get them there. So I'll be glad to take any questions or comments that you might have. Sir. Uh, General, I'm looking forward to reading the book. I uh, participated in a lot of it. I was at CENTCOM when the war started, did several years in Baghdad later on. The question I have, though, for you, and you describe the, the wire diagram for the Pentagon, and we've heard the story about how President Bush went around the room and asked all the service chiefs, do you have everything you need? And then he turned to Tommy Franks and asked Tommy Franks, do you have everything you need? And supposedly everybody said yes. But he was asking the wrong people because the service chiefs, like you said, they're not the ones that are fighting the war over here. They're providing to the combatant commander. And you had one service chief General uh, Shinshevsky that actually said, you're going to need a lot more soldiers. Right. 
and ended up getting his ass handed to him. Right. How do we get the people at your level that have the strength, power, insight? Or another to, anatomical part. That, yeah, <laughs> to say, guys, you got it all wrong. We need, and if you're going to go forward, then I'm out of here. Because the last quote that you said is what is going to be valuable enough for me to die for. And I'm that guy. Yeah. Luckily, yeah. I came home. Well, you know, it's, the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff have an interesting history. Uh, they were formed right after World War II, formalized in 1947 National Security Act. Their first war was the Korean War. Truman was having trouble with MacArthur. He asked the Joint Chiefs to you know, make sure MacArthur understands what, what the mission is, what we, what we need to do. The Joint Chiefs could not control MacArthur. Well, they had no authority, really, to do it. But they're supposed to be the senior advisors to the president, and, and they are the senior positions. And eventually, Truman has to go out and relieve MacArthur himself. Couldn't get it done through the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The next big war was Vietnam. And I would offer to you, you can read H.R. McMasters, who's now Lieutenant General in the Army. He was a brilliant young major that wrote a book called The Dereliction of Duty. And it was the failure of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the Vietnam War. In the first Gulf War, they were irrelevant. One of them actually got relieved for disclosing classified material in a press briefing. Uh, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, Rumsfeld never met with the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the uh, whole course of the war. He even consulted with them. So, and now this isn't a criticism of the people in the, in the, in the Joint Chiefs. I mean, you've got people like Omar Bradley and Colin Powell. I mean, these are our finest. It is a criticism of the system. There is no power. There is no authority. It's also a criticism of the political leadership that doesn't embrace, you know, generals and admirals that they trust. Remember George Marshall, who... Churchill said was the architect of victory. For FDR and Truman, he was their advisor and counsel on, on uh, foreign policy and military affairs. You know, and if you don't have someone like that, or, or several of them, that there's that trust. Because right now, the military relationship and the political uh, relationship is not good. It's not solid. It, there, you know, I'm not saying that uh, the military should dominate the conversation. Obviously, uh, civilian control of the military is a principle we hold dear, and I subscribe to very strongly. An obligation goes with that in that the civilian piece of that knows what the heck they're doing, and if they don't and they don't have the experience, they find, like Eisenhower did, even though Eisenhower had it himself, he found those that had military experience, strategic experience, and made sure they were involved in the analytical process that went on. Now, when you don't have that, and you have few generals that will stand up and be counted. You know why Rick Shinseki was so accurate? Rick Shinseki was the Army plans officer before he became chief of staff of the Army. Rick Shinseki used to be down in my headquarters every other month. He knew my plan inside out. He was constantly looking at the Army piece of the plan for Iraq and our other plans for Iran and elsewhere. When he became chief of staff of the Army, he had a concept of changing the army around, forming these striker brigades. He used to come down to my headquarters and say, as we go through this transition, I want to show you in your plan how we will continue to meet our obligation. So Rick knew the plan. 380,000 troops all across the board. And why? So when he said in that testimony before Congress, you need about 300,000 troops, he knew what the heck he was talking about. And those troops weren't there just to take down the regime seal the borders, control the people, all the things you needed to do with overwhelming force. Now, why my successor, who, may, who was part and parcel of developing that plan, didn't stand up to be counted, is a question that needs to go to him. Sir. I think that's over there. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, you mentioned in your speech, uh, we really haven't had an overarching strategic mindset since the end of the Cold War. Uh, of course, the last 20, 25 years, we've had presidents of both administrations. Uh, in, the in the near future, do you see this changing at all? Do you have any sense that this will change uh, when the next president's elected, or are we set, sort of set to continue? Well, uh, you know, I'm afraid the answer I would have to give you is I don't see it changing for several reasons. One, I think our entire national security structure needs to be revamped. 
The last time we had a major change in our structure and how we do business to reflect the world we're in was the 1947 National Security Act. So since 1947, all our bureaucracy has done is grow and become more bloated, more confused. I mean, I just gave you the, the Pentagon example, and it is very confusing. I mean, you, you, you'll see the service chiefs and the combatant commanders at each other's throats, the Joint Chiefs of Staff without any real authority in, 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 in any way. I mean, it's a, it's a very confused mess. No business would run like the government does now. I mean, you'd fail. It is, there's so much overhead. There's so much bureaucracy. Uh, it's so tiered in its structure. The decision-making process is so slow and ponderous in what you try to do. We have become a transactional and reactive uh, government in terms of national security and probably other elements of the responsibility of the government. We react crisis to crisis. You know, we, 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 uh, we do business on a day-to-day -day basis. There's no vision. You can't have a vision if you don't understand the world you live in, which requires strategic thinkers to examine the world. We don't value them in any way. The, the George Kennans and the George Marshalls, you know, are, are, are not to be found. Uh, in addition to that, we don't, think back, we don't sit back and think about who do we want to be now in this new world. The world has changed. It's more globalized. There's a greater power distribution. Uh, information technology and you know, cyberspace have changed the way we communicate and do business day to day. You know, to, to give you an example of poor strategic thinking is this idiotic pivot to the Pacific. I mean, how's that going for you right now, Mr. President? The pivot to the Pacific, you're buried in the Middle East. You got a European problem that could really uh, escalate into something dangerous. Our southern border and our southern hemisphere is in chaos, and we're pivoting to the Pacific, actually creating more military deployments. I mean, that tells you we don't have a global sense of what goes on, and you can't think regionally anymore. I don't see on the horizon how this improves. We, we Americans hate Washington, so we want to elect somebody who promises to run against Washington and fix it. Ever since Jimmy Carter, and including him, there's only been one president that knew how Washington worked, George H.W. Bush. He was a cabinet member, head of the CIA, a congressman. Every one of them, uh, the other ones came from outside. I mean, even President Obama, although he was a senator, he was so short a senator, he was Chicago to Washington and a, and a skip and a beat. And they come in, and they don't understand the government. They don't understand how things function. And they came in to, come in to change it, try to change a bureaucracy you, 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 is really difficult. And nothing happens. It actually gets worse. Actually, when they go to solve problems, they create more bureaucracy. We created the, the, the director of central intelligence. You know, that's a, that was another layer because intelligence community wasn't talking to each other. We created the Department of Homeland Security because we realized all these parts and pieces didn't communicate to each other. So the answer was add more bureaucracy to solve the problem. It's counterintuitive that it's going to do anything more than, than constipate the system. So the short answer to your question, we don't raise the people. We don't value them. That, that are the strategic thinkers and get them in the right position, and we have an archaic structure that makes it very difficult for us to think quickly, to operate quickly, to react quickly, uh, it, 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 the way business does now, that has streamlined everything. You know, the, the whole conceptual way our government's structured is an 18th or 19th century model. Thank you. Sir. Hi, thank you for all your information. Um, two things. One, you seem to support Colin Powell, but he really misinformed either intentionally or out of just not knowing what the situation was, both our country and the world. So I have a problem with him always representing the military on Memorial Day because one of the highest responsibilities of a, of a military person is to not unnecessarily put their troops in harm's way. And I feel he is memorializing, memorializing people who may be, should not be memorialized because they shouldn't have been killed anyway. Okay, the, the thing, <clears throat> your, your expose is excellent. Would it help to do a cost-benefit analysis of war, either historically or whatever, to see who the winners are, both domestically and internationally and politically, to understand basically where the money goes, was it well spent, 
And is this the kind of result we want to get out of this kind of situation? Because that may also bring out some of the motivations of how this stuff just get happens. You know, who, who are the winners and the losers in this situation? I mean, people and money. Where's all this money going and how well was it spent? That's, I think that's very important. Well, let me take the second one first. Uh, I think it's an excellent point. I, you know, uh, when I was in Afghanistan doing the assessment, they were beginning to do the planning for the withdrawal. The president had announced we'd be out by the end of 2014. And so I met with some of the senior logistics officers. I was shocked at the cost of withdrawing our forces. I mean, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars just to get out. I flew over Bagram Air Force Base and some of the other logistics bases, miles and miles of containers. Yeah, I watched some of the generals going by to figure out what they had on the ground because now you had to account for it and bring it home. I watched one of them open up a container. It had a commercial van in there, like an Econo line. He had no idea why that was there or how it got there. And why would you have it? Because obviously it isn't mine resistant and ambush proof. Uh, I talked to two service chiefs, Army and, and Marine Corps, and uh, about this. And both of them told me the cost of one Marine or one soldier for one year in Afghanistan was $1 million. You know, so uh, to go to your point, we are very expensive. Uh, you go on the ground and you see these forward operating bases, Little Americas. You know, there's, there's a guy that sells rugs in there, souvenirs. There's a mess hall line that you can eat anything from hamburgers to something, you know, really great. There's, th th there is, we spare no costs. Now, in a way, we love our troops, and we want made to make sure they have everything we can. But th that is taxpayer money that's going to come from somewhere else. The military is, is the wrong solution in some cases, like some humanitarian missions. The military does great at emergency response. We can be the first ones in. We have food, medicine, supplies, security. We could overwhelm it. But you don't want to leave the military. Once you get in there, once you get past that emergency phase, you want to see others come in that can do it more efficiently. Let me give you an example. When we went, when we went in to save the Kurds, we were feeding them, the military. And uh, my logistics guys told me the cost to feed one Kurd one day was $5 you know, per day. It was, and we, this is MREs flying them in. The ambassador, the US ambassador to Turkey at the time says, you guys are crazy. All you need to do is contract with these Turkish trucking companies and buy the local food, which the Kurds would use and are more familiar with. If you, you know, they're going, they're going to die eating MREs, I can guarantee you. <laughs> and so we did it. We actually went and contracted for these Turkish trucks to haul the stuff to the Kurdish camps we had established, and then we moved them back. We bought the basic kinds of foodstuffs on the open market there in Turkey to bring in. We went down to $1 per Kurd per day. You know, I mean, you, that's easy to understand. I mean, mm -hmm. the way we do things, if you're going to transport something in a, in, a, in a Turkish truck, it's going to be a hell of a lot cheaper than doing it in a military, it, through military means, or much more sophisticated and, uh, and technologically ad advanced uh, And I'm just kind of saying, do the whole war that way. But let the, let the public see what it costs and how the money was absolutely. spent. Absolutely. I mean, so, so this is something about the end of wars, uh, that we need to go back and look at, you know, and so I mean, I take your point uh, very well. We've become very expensive, and unfortunately, we throw this expensive solution against things where there would be better solutions if we would fund the other elements of government, like USAID and State Department, and provide the resources. Now they have other problems. I think culturally, they don't plan like the military. They don't understand how to deploy. They can't operate in a large scale. They are great at village work. They can't rebuild nations, as we've seen. Uh, you know, when, when I was in Iraq, I was amazed at the number of uniforms doing non-military tasks. You know, I, 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 we were running recreational swimming pools, monitoring the date palm harvest and providing pesticides. We were running the museums in, in, in Baghdad. Uh, they were, we were running the mediation groups, bringing the ethnic groups together to try to solve their problems. In, in Afghanistan, the, uh, the anti-corruption task force was headed by an army general, and almost everybody in the room had a uniform. Where was the Department of Justice to, 
to teach that or to enforce that in some way. The provisional reconstruction teams that went out to teach governance and at the province and, uh, and, and the uh, district level and, uh, and help establish programs were 80 percent military, not counting the, the security. You know, so this is an expensive way to do business. And Colin now, Powell? Yeah, on your first point. Well, first of all, I would never speak for Colin Powell. I admire him. I respect him. Uh, uh, and I have for a long time. I think he was, and I would just say, I think he was put in a tough position. He was asked by his president, he signed off to the administration to go to the UN. He went to the CIA. He was handed stuff he didn't have faith in. He could have resigned. He could have well, refused. That's a that's a decision. He he could he could violate his his sense of loyalty to the president he signed on to. I, I'm not look. I give you my. I can only give you my personal views. You want my loyalty? Give me your integrity. You don't but I'd like to see some other generals represent yeah. the military. But that's for him to answer. Okay. <coughs> General, I, I apologize for being here late. If you've already covered this, but would you speak to the language deficiency of our people overseas and what the implications are for our readiness? I seem to remember you said once during the Iraq War we only had five. Uh, people who spoke Arabic or something to that effect? Well, uh, l let me even broaden that. It's, it's more than language. La language is part of culture. It's cultural uh, awareness. It, you know, for me, as a, a regional commander in CENTCOM, one of the most valuable assets I had are what we call foreign area officers. These are officers, they may be artillery, pilots, infantry. Uh, they decide to go into this program, which is like a secondary duty. Uh, they go to school. They learn the language. They learn the culture. They are uh, they're they're like gold to you because they serve as your attaché. They run your security assistance programs. They really have insights into the culture, and that allows them to connect when they go out there. For the longest time, we couldn't get these officers promoted. I had a I had an officer. He was a major in the United States Army. I pinned more medals on this guy's chest for what he did when we opened up Central Asia. He was a uh, a Russian Central Asian foreign area officer, a one-man show out there. And he failed the selection. He had all outstanding fitness reports for me. He failed the selection lieutenant colonel. I called the chief of staff of the Army. I was irate. He said to me, well, he's an artillery officer. He hasn't been in artillery. He graduated from college, uh, at one of the Big Ten schools, magna cum laude. He went to Fort Sill. He finished number one in his class. All outstanding fitness reports as a battery commander you know, a, an artillery battery and, and a forward observer. He went into the foreign area officer program. Well, now he's competing against artillery officers. And despite what I say about the value, the unique value of what he brings, that wasn't valued by his own service. He eventually got out, uh, which was unfortunate, you know. So now there's, there's been changes in that. I mean, uh, the program now is, is more respected and they're trying to develop career paths. But we don't have enough of that, <laughs> that it, within the military. And I would say it's not just language. It's appreciation for the culture. Uh, George Tennant called me up one day when I was commander of CENTCOM, and he said, I'm, I want to come down to your headquarters. I want you, to give me, I want you to talk to me and give me some briefs about your part of the world. I said, George, what am I going to tell you? You're the director of central intelligence. You see all the intelligence. You get all the analysis. What am I going to give you? He said, I see it. I read it. I hear it. I don't have context. I need to see your part of the world through your eyes. So when he came down to my headquarters, he said, when I hear all this, what do I need to know? What's the framework I need to put it within? What, what is the context? I said, George, you know, I'm no expert in the Middle East. I've been involved in a, a several decades. I try to learn more and more every day, and it's like peeling back an onion. But I will tell you there are eight things that you had better understand before you even step foot in the Middle East. You know, one is you better understand the religion. There's a lot of myths and stories about it. You need to understand what Islam is, because it runs through the core of everything. It's not like in the United States where we separate you know, religion from governance and, and, and anything else. You better understand the desert, the geography, the physical aspects of the desert, because that shapes people. You better understand the colonial period, particularly after World War I. It's did nothing to do with the Crusades. It's all about what happened after World War I. You better understand the way the family structure is here. So these are the kinds of things I talked to him about. I said, here are the books to read, George. These are the places to go to get a feel and sense of it, and these are the people to talk to. Because if you don't have that, you're going to take your Western American prism and look at everything you see through that and totally miscalculate as a result. Thank you for all for coming out. I really appreciate it.